Well, we are in a session on raising equity capital and what to know as you work on raising equity capital. And we've got a good cross section of the capital stack here. And so we've got uh, John Mayfield who uh, works at Peak and we'll have him introduce himself, but mostly early and growth stage stuff. We've got Sam Orm who uh, works at B of A Merrill Lynch and, uh, and helps with uh, public equity activity. Uh, whether that's IPO or block trades or secondary offerings or I mean, uh, follow-on offerings. And then we've got Steve Smith, who is at Tower Arch Capital, uh, which is in more of the buyout segment of the equity capital stack. So um, most phases here are represented. <coughs> and so let's uh, start off by having them each introduce themselves a bit and introduce their firms, and then we'll jump into the topics. So, John? <clears throat> so, like Trent said, we're um, a seed fund. Um, we're on our third fund. Our first fund was 20 million. Our second fund was 55, and we just raised a third fund, uh, 75 million. Uh, we do seed and early Series A, which to us uh, means a company is generally doing anywhere from 20,000 to 200,000 a month in revenue. Um, we've done a few pre-seed, but um, that's generally reserved for uh, friends and family and kind of angel groups. Um, what else? We're, we've been around about five years and have invested in 52 companies of which about 35 are here in Utah. Um, some of the more notable ones, um, Divi, which spoke this morning, uh, we, we came in early on that one. Uh, Podium, uh, we came in about five years ago on that one. And what else? Uh, there's a whole whole list of others, but the ones that people know, Homey, um, that's been a divisive one that most people, some people like, a lot of people hate. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of them, but uh, so <laughs> I love them. I, I'm grabbing lunch with them after this. That's us. Perfect. Uh, Sam Orm, uh, head of investment banking uh, for uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch here in Utah, Arizona, Nevada. So B of A is really making a, a focus on what we call the middle market. So deals kind of north of 100 million to 2 billion is where we're focused on IPOs, um, secondary offerings, um, large uh, uh, you know, M&A transactions north of 100 million, private capital raises. You'll be surprised that uh, you know, back in the day, whenever you would go to raise private capital, say a larger venture round than what John does, you know, kind of a, a $50 million plus round. It used to be that you wouldn't use an investment banker for that, it was kind of frowned upon. And these days, money is so pervasive. If you're not uh, bringing an auction, if you will, to get the best terms on a larger round, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. So these private placement deaths have become much more pervasive. And uh, that's me. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Steve Smith, Tower Arch Capital. We're a middle market private equity firm focused on founder family owned uh, businesses. We have a $450 million fund currently. We have 700 million of equity capital based here in Draper, Utah. Uh, we have invested in 12 platform businesses, four of which are here in Utah. Uh, we focus on um, investments of kind of 5 million of EBITDA and up, 5 million to 25 million is our sweet spot. So businesses that have reached in that 20 million revenue range and north are uh, where we're at. We looked to partner with our management team. So for us, it's very much about the partnership dynamic and we're industry generalists from that perspective. Uh, we have a great team, have invested previously with a number of uh, predecessor firms. I was at a, a large billion dollar fund that was here in the Utah area for a while and uh, spent seven years there on the execution side as well. So it's great to be here. Great. All right. Uh, so I will definitely take questions from the audience. I've got a, a list of topics that we can cover, but want to make sure that if there are topics that the general uh, audience would like to, to hit that we don't somehow miss those. So uh, feel free to you know pipe up and, and ask a question. Uh, on a couple of housekeeping items, we are the session just before lunch. And so after we finish up at uh, 11.30, um, lunch is kind of 11.45. So this isn't one of the lunches where you're kind of eating while somebody's you know, giving their spiel. You're actually just gonna eat lunch. And so there's food trucks as you go out to your right, you can go hit the food trucks. 
get your food, and then you can go eat um, upstairs in the ballroom where breakfast or where that, that original meeting was or wherever you find a good place to, to squat. So, um, so those are the housekeeping items. And then make sure that you're visiting uh, you know, sponsors of the event like us that have booths, um, stop by the booth, uh, grab some raffle tickets, learn about the sponsors, and, uh, and enter yourself in either the raffle or putt for the prizes. So, all right. So we'll get going. Um, I think we'll we'll start. I sent you um, some some questions uh, yesterday to sort of prepare for some of the topics. And one of the ones that um, that I think it was Steve mentioned uh, to me that I thought was interesting is, uh, you know, I I was working with someone, a friend who just called me for some advice, and he said <coughs> so. His company had about five million in EBITDA, and had been growing at a pretty good clip. And so that's a company from a profile standpoint, growing at a good clip, good proven traction, could make sense for growth equity. And so Mercado was wanting to meet with them, and Pelion wants to meet with them, and they're all saying, you should take growth equity. We'll invest this much at this valuation, and then you can do these things. And then they'd meet with Sorensen, and Sorensen say, well, you should really consider a buyout, and we'll you know, help provide you know, liquidity, and there'll be a second bite of the apple. And, and, uh, and then they talk to an investment banker, and the investment banker, you really should just sell the company, and I can help you with that. And so um, I guess the question is, how does, and, and you can each kind of take a shot at this, but how does somebody know what's right for their company, not just from a financial profile standpoint, but for him, it was as an owner of a business, he had personal goals and thoughts and concerns. Um, how, do you, how do you find the right pocket of capital for you and not and sort of screen the self-interest of the audience or the people that you're talking with? Thoughts? You want to take that start? <clears throat> There's a, no right answer here, but um, I think it uh, comes down to what what is the goal of the owner of the business, um, first and foremost. Um, some people, um, I, I mean, they just want to have control and they want to run it the way they, they want to run it. I think also um, only the owner will know um, kind of their risk tolerance and their risk level um, <clears throat> to know, you know, sometimes having a partner can add risk, sometimes it can reduce risk. Um, and then I guess the only other thought I have is um, I think a lot of it, if you have a great business like that, it, it comes down to uh, you can find the right partner you want. You can be a little bit more selective. And so finding a, a partner that y you have chemistry with, I think that's um, a mistake. I mean, I talk with a lot of people uh, raising money, um, not just at the stage that I we invest in, but um, a lot of people treat, uh, especially – well, you know, debt raises are, I would say, a little bit more transactional, but they also treat equity raises pretty transactional sometimes. And um, I think I, I think um, it's smart to um, think of it as as much a partnership as it is a um, kind of a financial um, a, a financial event in the company. So um, if sometimes you don't have the luxury of choosing the person you want, but in this case, uh, it sounds like you might. Um, take some time, talk with lots of people, um, and actually set aside the time to um, run some sort of a process and, and just ask a lot of questions. So, um, I don't know if I have better advice than that. Yeah, so uh, great question, uh, Trent. Really appreciate it and a great answer, John. You know, from, from my perspective, I think about uh, oftentimes as equity capital, capital providers, uh, we can find ourselves being myopic about our solution or our product. And you may feel the same way about sometimes in your business. You think about your competition. You think about the customer base you're trying to serve, right? Your, your solution works well for a particular set of customers. It may not work for all customers. Such is true of debt capital providers, of equity capital providers. So it's really important, I think, to know uh, what stage your business is at and, and, more importantly, where you're going. And as you think about where you're going, you then can optimize which vehicle is going to best take you there, whether that's a debt vehicle, whether it's a venture vehicle, whether that's a private equity vehicle. Those things really matter. And so I think taking the time to step back and, and say, first of all, where am I going? But to answer your question, Trent, about who, where do I go to get that advice, you know, certainly you're going to surround yourself with trusted advisors, whether that's your existing banking relationship, your audit and accounting firms, partners, evaluation firm, you know, a great consulting firm investment banking group, uh, even the equity providers themselves, 
recognizing that at times we may have a jaundiced view or a biased view, right? And, and I would just be cautioning you against uh, being careful. Uh, certainly you wanted to have great legal advice, but you wouldn't want to go to a litigator and say, where's the best place for me to go and raise capital? Because a litigator is going to have a very different approach to risk, risk management, and where they're going to think about getting that capital versus someone who's a transactional-based attorney and, and very versed in the M&A or capital raise markets. Does that make sense? That's great. Yeah, I mean, Trent, I'd, I'd tell your friend to go for a walk and take a day off, right? <laughs> and, and think about uh, what, what did Gandhi say? Uh, the soul's true desire is always fulfilled. And uh, that individual needs to figure out you know, wh where he wants to go uh, with his business. And I think a lot of individuals uh, sometimes get uh, clouded by the transaction and the opportunity and maybe the dollars. Uh, to think about what they really have in, in a market like this where growth is the greatest asset available, right? We're in, we're in a world where uh, debt is free uh, in some countries, right? Uh, you know, Germany, et cetera. Um, uh, equity is pervasive and, and growth is extremely hard to find uh, your commodity is is growth that you you own that and so that is very valuable and you know whether that's protected by IP or a great business model or system or technology or teams or or field crews whatever your whatever that moat is that's going to provide you that growth can be better achieved through certain partnerships whether that's peak or tower arch right these two individuals on both sides of me they have not missed, they're two of the most successful funds in the country, let alone Utah. So these guys have not missed putts in the last five years, right? You name the putt, they've hit it. And so it's a testament to Utah, it's a testament to them, but it's a testament to partnering with the right individuals that see their skill sets that match theirs and that puts them in the right vehicle to get them to that destination. Great, thanks. Again, raise hands if you got questions, but uh, I can keep going. So, um, what about when is when is the right time for people to start talking with you? And that might be a, a leading question, but uh, uh, should it be you know right as they're you know when should they start talking with you? Do they do they need to have all their ducks in a row and they've got their financial model and their their forecast ready and then start talking to you or else you're not going to respect them or or what's what's t the right way to approach talking yeah, to capital for us I mean we're a big part of our job is just getting to know people uh, getting to know them early and um, you know it's very rare that we we meet entrepreneurs and you know do a deal within a month or so of meeting them. A lot of times we've known the people for, you know, as little as six months, but a lot, most of the time, you know, a couple of years. So for us, we, we like to, to follow the journey. I think there's a, there's a pretty good blog post out there, uh, might be worth looking up. It's called Lines Not Dots or something like that. And I think it's kind of, you know, for us, we're, we're reading the tea leaves a little more than, you know, someone that has the luxury of financials and operational history. Um, so ours is probably skews a little more art than science. And so we're kind of looking for um, kind of progress, their ability to recruit people, um, how the evolution of their plan is coming together, um, how customers are responding to what they're giving. And so, so it generally takes us um, maybe a little bit more time. We, we don't really get into auction type processes where it's, you know, we're just getting a data room. Like data rooms are... Um, almost a negative thing in our world. It's kind of, we want to have kind of a proprietary deal that it's someone leaving, you know, a Domo uh, and a Qualtrics and they're teaming up and they're building something. It's, you know, that's kind of our world a little more. And so for us, um, I can only speak for, for my stage, but we like to, to get to know individuals and teams over the course of months, if not years. Um, so that's, that's how it works for us. Yeah, I'd, uh, if there's someone interesting in this world that is trying to change it, you want to know them. And, uh, and
And so that's never too early uh, to get involved. In terms of getting documents prepared or getting ready for a transaction, I got a call from a venture capital friend who said, Sam, could you help these guys out? They have a deal under LOI. Uh, they need to get it financed. Uh, we take a look at the materials, and I did, and it was a solid, you know, C plus, B minus job. And so I, I gave them some other examples of other uh, of ways to enhance that. So when they do go to market uh, to raise that capital, uh, it was kind of a fun the sponsor deal they're trying to put together that they're going to be better prepared institutionally. I do think that's extremely important uh, because one thing that you're always shocked on, right, I'm, I'm 44 now, um, you know, my first IPO when I was 24, uh, it, you're, the one thing that you, you forget about, uh, that you, you're never taught in school, is how lazy investors are uh, in the big cities, right? <laughs> Uh, it's it's shocking. So whether that's a, a Bank of America where you're trying to get financing, uh, we'd like to think we're not that way because we're here in town and we got a whole team and we dig deep. But if you're an IPO investor and you're going to Fidelity, that Fidelity investor is making a decision to invest in your shares in about seven minutes and he's putting $30 million in, right? Versus these guys, they're getting in early with the relationship, so it's a totally different skill set. But so when you're going to institutional capital and some of these big pools of money, you have to make sure you have a very tight story, because whether that's Blackstone or, or Aries, I'm sure you guys know the Aries guys. They're they're here in town all the time. Uh, they want a really nice tight story, and you might as well give it to them. Yeah, I, I'm not much to add there other than early is always great. Uh, it depends on, again, where you're at in your transaction. You certainly don't want to, if you're not prepared internally with the right materials or you're going through a significant, whether it's a systems change or a key operational improvement in the business, perhaps now is not the right time to go to equity partners and show that hand. Uh, again, it's going to depend on your business. I think much like, you know, for me in my career, I got some advice pretty early on to find a great mentor and, uh, and seek out that mentor and then, and then constantly kind of develop those relationships. I think the same thing's true for an equity partner. If you're, if you're looking to be transactional and just raise equity capital, flip your business and move on, then I'm not sure that it, that it matters much when you go to a partner. Uh, if you're looking for a true partner that can help you establish a legacy in your business and develop a brand or develop a reputation and, and do something like uh, Sam mentioned to change the world, then you may want to find the, that right mentor. And you may not be at their size today, but you spend the time and effort of developing and cultivating that relationship so that when you are, you're ready to strike when that iron is, is hot. Great. Uh, just adding on that, one of the uh, great pieces of advice I got uh, from a board member when, when I was the CFO of Orange Soda, he was the independent board member, um, Roy Banks. He's been very successful helping grow and sell multiple payment processing companies. And he said he's got his own personal board of directors. And so it's not the board of directors for the company, it's his personal board of directors. When he's making key decisions, he goes to his board of directors, and it's informal, it's not like the, it's a paid position or anything, but he goes to these people and says, here's what I'm considering, and here's what I'm thinking about, um, what, what do you think I should do? And, and so I built my own version of that as well, and it's uh, served me well. So, um, all right, and then as far as, uh, as accessing the equity capital markets, um, uh, let's maybe go with, with Sam. Like, How open are, in your view right now, the public markets to various sizes of companies? When, when can somebody's company start thinking about going public, and why might they want to think about going public rather than focusing on trying to flip it with a strategic sale? Yeah, so the great thing about going public is is um, you know obviously the cost of capital is the lowest, and uh, you can get you know the highest valuations in general, and uh, unless you're called WeWork, and uh, you've watched that debacle there, and I think that's a lesson in corporate governance more than it is a lesson in the business model, but uh, self-dealing and uh, and dishonesty to your investors is something that's never rewarded. And 
when it costs somebody $30 billion over a two month period, it's fairly shocking. That's the GDP of, of Africa. I don't know, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's a big number. Um, but the markets are wide open. We're talking with a number of companies here. I do not think there's gonna be another IPO uh, here in Utah in the next uh, six to 12 months. But the next 12 to 24, I think there will be uh, two to three. And uh, uh, those are the companies you could guess uh, that are out there. And um, the, the markets are wide open. We have uh, a number of conversations going currently with a number of firms here in Utah, frankly. Uh, so do you need to be profitable? Do you need a certain level so, of revenue? What so do you we think? Just, so we just hit the peak uh, again from, 90, from 2000 where, what is it, 33% of companies filing to go public are, uh, are losing, are, are EBITDA negative, right? Uh, so it went like this, and you imagine the, uh, the, the down point was 2009 when zero companies went public when they were EBITDA negative, and now I think it's back up to 33% or something. And so, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean we're due for a recession? Does that mean the market's frothy? Uh, you know, I, I think it goes back to my original comment. The, the market is rewarding growth. People cannot grow. These guys have access to companies that are growing. Those are very, very valuable assets. Um, and investors are going to pay a ton of money for that growth when a company's growing at 40% a year, you know, because if you invest in a T-bill in certain countries, again, it's zero. So uh, that growth is still there, and that, that spread is fairly consistent. And so uh, I don't, I don't want to be the one pounding the table that, that we're due for a, a recession here or something, because, uh, you know, you look at all the different factors, and Sure, that statistic looks horrible on a chart, right? We're back to pets.com, right? Like we're, we're back to- uh, Web van. <laughs> my, my first client was, was Ask Jeeves. You guys don't even know Ask Jeeves. Who oh, Ask Jeeves? Ask Jeeves. <laughs> Dog so, pile. So imagine this business model, right? The, there was no technology. It was Cal Berkeley students that, uh, that they were paying $7 an hour part-time to go into a basement and type questions into a search engine, thinking what questions Steve may want to ask that day, <laughs> right? How do I find a, a bagel in Berkeley? You type in the question, right? There was no technology, right? So we've come so far, and, and all these businesses that are going public, there is a clear path to profitability over the next year to 24 months for sure you're not seeing companies go public where profitability is still 24 months out hey sam can you speak to can you speak to scale because you know recognizing yeah. for an investor like us so we, we we know that to access public debt and public markets the debt generally you've got to have a business around 40 to 50 million dollars yeah. of ebitda to access the public markets from a debt perspective what are the thresholds on the equity side for IPO and, and equity raises from that perspective? Yeah, so, so just so people understand, for, for debt, once you get to 40 and 50 in EBITDA, debt becomes shockingly more available, cheaper, and fewer covenants. So if you're a private equity firm and you start with an asset that's $100 million and you, you build that up and maybe it's got 20 in EBITDA and you build that up, you're gonna get a ton of multiple expansion once you get over a certain threshold, just because the larger private equity firms can come in and pay a lot more because they have a lot more debt available. For the public companies, you really do not wanna go public unless your market cap is north of $500 million. I just think it's, it's hard to do something that small. Uh, you can do it, we do it all the time, uh, but you know, I think 300 minimum market caps and if you look at the tech industry, right, so if you have a $50 million company with recurring revenue that's growing 50% a year, you know, that's probably going to be, you know, a 10 times revenue multiple, talking generically, right? That's a $500 million market cap, but, the, but, the, but Wall Street's going to reward that because they're growing at 30 or 40% a year, and they may even do better than that. There's some of these companies that are doing that just because that 
growth is such a commodity. So uh, that, that's kind of how I'd answer that yeah. question. Uh, the, Great. Um, so could you speak to, I mean, how often do people come to, and this is probably more a question for Steve and for John, and come to you and say, I'm looking to raise equity capital, and they're just a complete wrong fit for for you from a stage standpoint or, or whatever, and, and how do they get so, sort of smart on the right pockets of capital that they should be going after? And, and maybe one of you, if you didn't mind, maybe give a quick sketch of what what is the um, continuum of the pockets of equity capital. I, I, I don't mind if, yeah. I mean, I can do that, but if no. one of you didn't mind doing that, so we start at oh, yeah. seed, work our way yeah. up to public equity, and, and how do you know the right ones to go to and not seem sort of sheepish that you went to the wrong pocket? Yeah. Uh, I'll give a quick overview of kind of the, the stages of capital and then maybe let John chime in on, on seed particularly. You know, as you think about uh, the verticals in, in equity or debt, uh, there's investment strategy, there's geography, and then there's industry vertical. So you think about the strategy, you have seed capital, and then venture capital, growth capital, buyout like us at, at Leverage Buyout Shop, and then you have a distressed debt. So all types of funds or all types of investors may fall along a particular uh, strategy. And then they'll employ that strategy either within verticals or within geographies or both. And so as you think about that prospect, we oftentimes find that someone has soft circled uh, they're in a particular vertical. They see that we've done a deal in that same vertical, and they may come to us for, for equity, recognizing that they're not at the size, they may not be in the right geography, or they may not be in the, the, the right investment strategy for what they're looking to do. And so I think, you know, Seed's a, a classic example that you play across the spectrum. There's places where that you have a sweet spot for you guys. It'd be interesting to kind of share. Yeah. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll speak, speak mostly to the early stage, but early stage is not kind of one big lump. I, th I think he nailed it with, you got your geography, you've got your kind of stage, and then you've got your industry focus. Um, most seed firms, that are, you know, there's thousands of them that are kind of like our stage. They call them micro VC, kind of sub 100 million funds. Um, the smaller you go, uh, this kind of harkens back to that comment I made about art versus science. You know, the more local you generally get, and because it, that's because you're kind of relying on um, signal um, and, and kind of um, kind of trying to suss out uh, some of these um, intangible things, um, and you're trying to figure out. You know, we're doing a lot of back channeling on people um, and, and things like that. So, so for the early stage in particular, uh, you know, I'd say there's. I don't, I don't know if this is relevant for anybody in this audience, but you get your kind of friends and family rounds, um, usually sub 250k. Uh, and seed has really turned into, we, we say like three different stages within seed. You've got your, so you got your friends and family. That's kind of really early before you, you know, you have any business really So if you're giving money. advice real quick to not, I mean, friends and family doesn't probably apply to the vast majority of the people here. Nonetheless, if, if you were giving advice on friends and family, how should, should, should they like get a generic safe note and do that with their friends and family or should they do convert or should they sell common equity to their friends and family? What should they, what would you do? A lot of times it's coming either from the founder or from their family, but yeah, I would say um, safe notes or convertible notes are quite common and it's usually, they have a uh, two features, a discount and a cap. Um, sometimes you'll see them without a cap and just a discount, but the most standard bread and butter is with a discount and a cap and it's usually in the one to three million dollar range. That just means that at the next round it's going to convert either at a discount or at that cap. Um, so you got your friends and family, but then there's pre-seed that's kind of 500K and down, and then you pull into uh, more traditional seed, what we kind of consider seed now. And that's, there is traction. I mean, seed is, you know, a lot of times y there is a requirement and that's because, you know, back in the day, you, you really had to, I mean, you had to build all your own infrastructure, you had to code everything. And now you've got AWS, you've got Azure, you've got all kinds of technologies that have helped abstract away a lot of the complexity of early, you know, development. Um, so that's $1 million to $2 million, and then you've got your second seed or like a really early Series A that's kind of one and a half to $4 million. Um, what, you had another question in there that maybe hasn't been addressed. That I, 
Is so I, th- I think, yeah, I mean, I think we kind of talked about it in that, uh, so, so what are the various stages? And I like that you gave yeah. better visibility into to the early stage. And so SAFE, if, uh, you may or may not have heard of it, a SAFE is a relatively new thing that's pioneered in the last few years. It's a simple agreement for future equity, but it's a lot like a convertible note. And it seems like it's getting less popular recently than the convertible notes. Like I saw it all yeah. the time, and now I'm seeing people kind of revert back to convertible note. Um, but basically it's like, Hey, I have no idea how much your business plan is worth right now. So I do know you need some funding. I'll give you some funding right now with no fixed price. But when you do a formal round with somebody like John, then we get to convert what we invested to equity at a 25% discount to the investment, um, strike price that, or the price of the preferreds that they did in the same security. And so it'll become a, a preferred security at that point. So. Um, the other question that I kind of asked is like, how do you avoid being the person that showed up? Hey, I want to meet oh, with yeah. you. I want That's an it. investor. And then you sit down to lunch and realize I shouldn't be meeting with this person. They're not interested in my industry or they're not in, I'm the wrong stage for them, or I'm, I'm just not the right fit. How do they find the right fit for the right pocket of capital for their sort of sort? Yeah, sort of I think this is a problem for a lot of companies and a lot of, um, a lot of investors as well. We, you know, we get that every day. Um, I think, it's really you got to get out of the office and just talk with a lot of people. Um, you know, it's we get referred a lot of deals and we try to be as helpful as possible. The one thing is you you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, uh, just investors do talk a little bit, and sometimes you can, um, you know, if if I'm sending a deal to someone that's close or somewhat close to ours, there's always that question of uh, why aren't you guys doing the deal? And, it, and it sometimes you, you kind of start a little bit in the negative by doing that. But I think, you know, there's people like Trent or Advanced CFO or, um, you know, there's good legal counsel. There's good, you know, people that uh, play up and down the capital spectrum like investment banks that, that, that are pretty dialed into this stuff. I think having first conversations with some of these professionals is a good first step. Or look at a company that you kind of think is similar to yours, and if they've taken – um, equity. I, I always say that's that's like the best way to get introduced to like a tower arch is, is hey, I've got a company that is very you know similar stage and kind of life cycle is a company they backed. I'm going to go talk with that CEO and generally people are pretty receptive to that yeah. and they've been through that process of equity raising and so you know they can be a really good and valuable starting point. Yeah, finding good case studies, finding good examples in the market space, market space, and watching for other transactions similar to yours. You know, a perfect example for us is we, we partnered with a gentleman named Don Riggs down in Dallas, Texas about five years ago on a business doing fiber installation and maintenance only in Dallas. And, uh, and the, the business was owned by a gentleman named Don Riggs and his partner. His partner wanted to go build a bass fishing pond and retire. And, uh, and so Don was happy to do that and, and partnered with us at Tower Arch and said, hey, I want to I want to build a big business. I see a huge opportunity here. The problem is my customers are trying to take me outside of Dallas and I just can't afford to grow with them and, and serve my customers in other parts of the country. And I also don't have the capital to go acquire other businesses where I see lots of opportunities throughout the country. So we partnered with Don and then went on an acquisition spree. And we've done, we, when, we, when we partnered with him, the business had 30 million in revenue. We've done 10 acquisitions in that deal. And, and as Sam knows, we could raise public debt on that, that deal today. So uh, they're approaching nearly $300 million in, in revenue in just four and a half, five years. And that's a perfect example of someone who knew what they wanted, knew what they were looking for. Their partner wanted to retire, and that made sense. But this gentleman wanted to grow, and he found the right pocket of capital to help accelerate his business and move that to the next level. Yep. That's great. And, and that's why you partner with guys like this if that's your goal, right? They never could have done that without Tower Arch. They just couldn't. Well, they could have. I'm sure they could have. <laughs> you guys were really good at Anyways, uh, I love John's comment, John, about we don't worry about the data room. I don't want to put uh, words in your mouth, but I just love that. It speaks to how personal the relationship is. You know the business model is going to change. You know whatever you're underwriting is going to be completely different six months from now. Yeah. And so you're, you're doing this on a lot of tangentials that you've yeah. brought together. So as you think about investing um, from both of your funds or as you think about trying to raise capital for somebody in the public markets, uh, how important is the strength of the CFO 
Uh, and what, what indicates to you a strong CFO? I'll, I'll take a stab. Uh, uh, CFO, elitist CFO does not exist in the world anymore, right? We've become too efficient. That CFO needs to be FP&A guy. That's financial planning and analysis guy. Or girl. Or girl, thank you, Trent. Mm -hmm. uh, plus CFO, plus well-versed in in all the different aspects of, of uh, you know transactions and debt, and uh, and and be pretty up on technology as well because these things move quick, and um, and that FP&A individual plus CFO. If you can get that person that that CFO that wants to dig into the weeds and understand the business model down to the metrics that investors going to want to understand it, then you found the right person. I think that like playing Jenga and you're down to that last block that if you pull out the whole thing falls apart, that's the CFO. And uh, at least for us, it's, it's a really important function and we put a lot of value in stock and if, uh, a lot of the questions we get asked around operational improvements in the business are, what are the key things that you, the first things that you look at when you're making an investment? And for us, it's the, the, the finance function. So we're looking to the office of the CFO for financial controls, operational improvement. I think Warren Buffett said it well when he said, you know, uh, the, it, it's better to be focused on the field than on the scoreboard. And he talks about basically as an investor focusing on the field and the operations than on the scoreboard. I think at times as investors, we can focus too much on the scoreboard. Certainly the CFO, if anyone else in the business isn't, has their eyes on the field. And you're thinking about how sales and operations uh, mesh. You're thinking about the forward aspects of capitalizing the business for growth and potential downturns. You're thinking about really driving that business to the next level with your customers and your contracts. It's a really important role and one that uh, it continues to be increasingly important with uh, technology and other aspects, as, as you all well know. So for us, it's a very important role, for sure. <clears throat> this might be an unpopular statement, but... Um, at our stage, and we and we focus on technology companies at the early stage. <clears throat> we actually, uh, if it's a seed stage company or just getting off the ground, there's a CFO. It's actually kind of a slight negative, um, just because it's like, what are you focused on? Um, usually, it's product and sales at our stage, and they're just fighting for life. Um, and so, there's not a lot of you know financial stuff to chief. So, it's. Advanced CFO is like a good option. This is not an advertisement for them, but um, those types of options are, are you know, more relevant at our stage. We, we They just don't need somebody there generally, uh, you know, 50, 60 hours a week doing the, the kind of finance position. Controllers, yes. Um, outsource CFO, sure. Um, or just even an advisor that can kind of help guide some of the big decisions, that's super helpful. But if you've got kind of as your founding team a CFO, um, and this, you know, this might be completely wrong for a manufacturing business or a uh, med tech business or something like that, but for technology and software, it's not really that necessary. Well, we're, we're seeing more and more early stage companies have fractional all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And so they figure out what their core is and they'll have a fractional CMO and a fractional CFO and a fractional like, you know, accounting for just, you know, doing the books. But I actually think that's, you know, a smart way to go. You might say, well, we need somebody to do something. And so you, you grab somebody that can wear multiple hats and they actually don't do a great job of any of those things. So when I went into Orange Soda, I felt like I inherited this big rat's nest because it could it had quickly outgrown its infrastructure. But, uh, but had they kind of outsourced that stuff, it probably would have been relatively clean what I step into. So um, it can be really good to have uh, have those fractional resources so you actually get really great high-level advice, um, but you're not paying for the full-time resource to get that high-level advice quite yet. So... Um, Got a question yeah. out there, Trent. Yeah, okay. Or if we go like strategic or, or other markets for an exit strategy? 
and just to clarify, so I want to make sure I understand your question. You're asking how we view your exit to someone like us versus strategic or an IPO. Is, is that right? So how do you decide between those options? Yes. Yeah. I, mean, look, I think at the end of the day, it's, again, it's, it's where you're headed. Um, you know, the benefit of being a publicly traded company, and, and, and Sam's, you know, one of the best, and so being able to speak to that market, having a currency to attract talent, to attract the resources to your business, to give yourself the notoriety in the market, marketplace, whether that's with customers, whether that's with suppliers. You know, there's, there's reasons to be public, right? At, at the same time, there's reasons to be private, uh, not being subjected to quarterly kind of fluctuations in the marketplace, uh, potential hostile takeovers of, of your, equi your, your cap table and fluctuations in your cap table, the fluctuations in the stock price. Uh, you know, your, your partner may take a longer term view and be more patient from a capital perspective. So it really, again, it comes back to kind of where you're headed as a company, where the owners and the, and the um, investors really see the business moving. And, and for us, you know, at, at Tower Arch, we've had opportunities to take publics and exit uh, companies public. But for us, we take into account the management team and where they're headed. We really try to think long term about the legacy of the business and what's right for management. We're in a deal right now where we left uh, a full turn of, of uh, multiple on the table uh, to leave management in a better hands with the, the exiting partner rather than a partner that didn't make sense for management team. They'd be swallowed up as a strategic and real no operating value for the team. So again, it comes back to you and kind of where you want to want to go. There, there's a full spectrum of investors out there, and finding the right investor for what you want to do does exist. And we may not be that one. We may be. It just depends. And I think finding that right partner for you is, is what matters most. One, one thing, the piece of advice that I got that I always kind of liked was that uh, great companies aren't sold, they're bought. Uh, meaning that a lot of times if you're putting a for sale sign out in front, then it's like, okay, well, what's wrong with it? Um, so if you're focused on running your business as if you could someday be a public company and leaving that option open, public company is probably the lowest probability outcome for the vast majority of companies. But if you're focused on being a company that you could own for the long term and you could provide reporting to people if you needed to and you could provide guidance because you've got good forecasting, then people will start banging on your door and saying, I want your company, your company's awesome, and they'll be willing to pay up and you've got all the leverage in the situation because you're like, well, we're kind of aimed toward this. So if you're going to short circuit that, you're going to have to pay up. So the more you focus on the long term and build a great company, the more people will be banging down your door to try and buy your great company. And so I, I, it always frustrates me a little bit that people are like, well, what's the trend right now? If we just attach the name like machine learning to it, then people will pay a bigger multiple. And it's like, well, fundamentally build a better company and people will pay up for that great company. So build, you know, focus on that and you'll have a wealth of options available to you, similar to the guy that I referenced up front. So, um, any any funny war stories that you can share that uh, that'd be a, sort of a, an interesting case study or, or or you know something along those lines? I don't know if it's funny, but it, it's a pretty tragic uh, story actually. You know, as investors, we don't always get it right. And in private equity, my first experience investing was uh, in a business that served into the wind farm construction market in uh, in 2008. And uh, while uh, the Obama administration had just passed a five-year production tax credit to extend the tax credits and really extend the life of renewable energy, and there was a lot of green uh, uh, trends, to your point, and a lot of interest in that space, we made an investment in a business that was serving that market. And what we didn't see, what we missed, was the pull-through aspect of the tax credits getting sold through to pockets of, of capital, which then funded those farm construction. And uh, when the credit crisis hit, th those tax pools went away, and the buying of those pools went away, and thereby new farm construction went away. And in less than 12 months, we flushed $90 million. So we don't always get it right. Um, but what, what's important is when we don't get it right is how we treat or how your partner treats the management team and treats their credit providers in that, in that uh, deal. We were able to make sure that we recapitalized the business. We lost the keys but we recapitalized the business in a way that was more flexible for the management team as a going concern, and then left the management team in position with equity, even though we lost all of ours, so that they could have uh, you know, long-term mass uh, growth prospects in the business. So it doesn't always, we don't always get it right, but a, a real partner will try and find ways to make it right. Any other fun war, war stories from yeah, here? Yeah, you know, it, it's hard to share those in a, in a group, so I commend Steve. <laughs> uh, 
I once invested in oil field services business when oil was $100 a barrel. Um, we bought it for four times EBITDA, which we thought was extremely cheap and commensurate with the risk. And, uh, you know, we got our money back, but you lost three years of your life doing it, right? So these, these bad investments, are, 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 uh, they take a lot of time and a lot of effort. And you think the amount of effort they spent trying to do the right thing for the business and got no reward for it, then you lose two years of your life. Those are, those are emotion times. And so even to talk about it, it's hard to think, it's hard to talk about because it was just a ton of work. But you did the right thing and you know, you're never going to hit you know, um, every single deal. And, uh, but the deals that you do succeed at are gonna way make up for any of those risks if you, if you, do, the, if you do a good job. Great. Well, looks like we're, we're out of time, but uh, I want to thank the panelists. And, uh, and so let's thank the panelists. Good job. <laughs> yep, and I just do think as, as finance professionals, the, the more you can put yourself out there and not just be great at execution, but be great at relationship building, get better at storytelling, um, then if you can tell the story of why you're going to succeed, it's like if you build it, they will come practically thing. So um, working on, on doing those aspects and creating relationships up front with great firms like this will pay dividends. So, all right. Thanks again. Thanks, Trent. I should have, John, I should have. Uh...